Joy Lynn and my team and myself are going to be talking to you guys a little bit about home automation for the visually and hearing impaired. So as I mentioned previously, my name is Joy Lynn Donnelly. Um, I study computer engineering here in Manhattan and I acted as the team lead and worked within software applications. And I specialize mostly in object recognition and computer vision. I'm Jamar Lewis Ortega. I'm an electrical engineer, I'm primarily working with hardware, specifically haptic feedback and device reliability. I'm Mark Saglambini. I'm a computer and electrical engineer. I'm focusing on the hardware and software, uh, mainly program development and uh, server management. And I'm Patrick Squiet. I'm an electrical engineer, and I will also be focusing on the hardware with an emphasis on electronics and sensors. So to give a little background on our project, um, as we know, technology supplements a lot of our daily life nowadays. Um, and for that reason, it is a great opportunity for us to help those who don't have the same um, capabilities as us. So this application is mostly for the hearing and visually impaired. Um, we use the background of Dr. Elanaya's work with her partner um, that focused on data fusion algorithms um, for the visually impaired and they focus on computer vision, um, sensors, and image processing. So to go a little bit deeper, um, Dr. Alman and her work breaks down the subcategories of assistive technology, such as vision enhancement, vision substitution, and vision replacement. Um, so ultimately, they offer the proposed solution of data fusion algorithms and sensor-based data using computer vision to um, ultimately provide feedback to the user. So this was a breakdown of their work. Um, so this is their server, um, which we ultim ultimately based our server off of. And we will demonstrate that later on. But to the right, we see their breakdown um, of their algorithm and how it implements into the server and how it implements into the devices. So we also cross reference this with um, a previous year's capstone group. And in their work, they came up with a solution of an on-person device that a user who is visually and hearing impaired would wear. Um, and so this ultimately produced haptic and um, audio feedback. So this is the same realm we decided to go into, but at, on an on-person um, device, it can run into issues such as, honestly, just um, efficiency. It's not always easy to wear something on your person at all times. And in addition, it runs into a lot of power consumption and power efficiency. So we, we aim to, um, remove this issue and move forward with the same design. So just to cross-reference a little bit of what's on the market now, um, ERA came out around 2014. So it ultimately was for the visually impaired. Um, it was a goggle system, a, a smart goggle, if you will. And it created um, greater accessibility in the sense that it provided verbal feedback um, from an operator who worked for the company. So there was a video feed that um, an operator looked at and provided this feedback via an earpiece to the user, to the visually impaired person. Um, and while this is good, it runs into the issue of lagging. It's not real time um, as much as you would like it to be. And it doesn't aid um, a hearing impaired person anyway, actually. It takes away from their peripheral sound and anything going on in the background. So this is something we also looked at. Same thing with the well-known Amazon Alexa and Echo. While it's cost efficient and it can help with daily tasks, it does not return any um, anything for a hearing impaired person. And that's where we differ. That's what we're looking to change. We're looking to take all of this and put it into one, um, one device that will help both um, hearing and visually impaired while still remaining cost efficient. So here we have a picture. Um, we felt this shows, uh, you know, how smart homes can be implemented uh, pretty well. So we have a, a application on the top right and different nodes around the home, um, and then a server that does the communication between the two. Uh, and this shows all the different applications that could possibly be used. So more and more smart um, smart devices are becoming prominent. Uh, as Joy was mentioning, there's smart speakers. Uh, there's much many more devices. Uh, AI and machine learning are only improving. Um, and now you can find technologies such as just Wi-Fi built into many things, including refrigerators, coffee makers, and sprinkler systems today. Uh, and as Joy was also mentioning, we saw the opportunity to uh, to improve. You know, there's there's many ways to improve these systems to help those that are visually or hearing impaired. 
So, uh, you know, here we have two examples of what's out there right now. Uh, we have a door, smart doorbells, which are, we have here a picture, a ring. Um, there's the Nest. There's also Arlo. Those are some popular ones um, which you can talk through and see live updates and things like that. There's also smart, um, you know, alarm systems which have different nodes around the home. Um, the competition for this market is continuing to grow um, and you get the alerts on your devices. So as Joy was also mentioning, one of our big advantages here is that the um, our system is not going to be multiple applications. With those where you have a you would have a Nest app for like the doorbell, the Simply Safe app for the um, for the alarm, and our system is going to be one application that handles all of the um, updates to the user. This will allow them to set it up once, so it's ease of use, um, and they can set it for their preferences, for their uh, abilities and their capabilities. Um, you know, in many different smart homes, they're not really considered smart if you think about it, because all of those different smart devices have no idea that the other smart devices exist. In our system, everything communicates with each other um, and will update together. Um, it's also going to be energy efficient, um, and it's definitely focused on the hearing and visually impaired. So, you know, so what's the need for this? Um, you know, there's many different um, safety emergencies, things like smoke alarms, maybe a pet barking, um, even just a door knocking. Um, or doors locked, those different kinds of states. Um, with, the, with the population with two to 8% of the US population either being blind or deaf, um, there's definitely a need to help these people out, make sure they're safe and they're getting the updates they need to live a more comfortable life. Um, so how are we gonna do this? We're gonna have multiple home nodes throughout the home. There's gonna be one server that manages all the communication between all these different devices. They're gonna be constantly checking for updates. It's going to be analyzing audio and video throughout the home for object detection, audio detection. Um, there's going to, it's going to be checking location of different objects around the home, maybe a pet, something along those lines. Um, all these devices are going to be updating through the server to the user through sound and haptic feedbacks of the iOS application. Uh, and for our project selection, we found that people with disabilities are the ideal candidates for assistive technology that incorporate ETAs, EOAs, and PLDs. Uh, the criteria we looked at when deciding between alternative approaches were cost, feasibility, and ease of use. Um, the three approaches we considered were a completely wearable device, a system with only external sensors, and a full system that was a combination of the two. After giving each one a weighting, we decided the best approach is a full system that used both external devices and a on-person assistive device. From there, we created a list of criteria we wanted to consider in our design, and those were cost, reliable object detection, reliable RFID and GPS, uh, response time, haptic feedback, and device communication. Uh, we ranked those against each other and found reliable object detection and reliable RFID and GPS to be the most important. And then from that, we developed our specific marketing requirements, the most important being accurate motion object detection, as well as quick response time. And then from there, we developed need categories, which were easy set up, high accuracy, cost effectiveness, and low response time, high accuracy being the most important. And we could see the breakdown of these needs in this objective tree. And we could see that high accuracy is broken down specifically into edge detection, motion detection, voice and sound recognition, and reliable GPS and RFID. Uh, then we have our engineering requirements, the most important being a power efficient system, an accurate object and motion detection with depth perception capabilities, and reliable RFID GPS to locate objects and people around the home. And then our traceable chart relates these marketing and engineering requirements and how they satisfy one another. Um, in order to uh, achieve as many of the marketing and uh, engineering requirements as possible, a series of trade-offs would need to be made. Uh, for example, as you can see here, um, having an emphasis on uh, accuracy may uh, have a decrease uh, in response time, as well as um, having focus on response time, you may need to um, uh, use lighter uh, processes for the object detection and the uh, location services, so they may not be as accurate. So just to go a little bit deeper into our object detection algorithm, um, as we said, um, accuracy is very important, and we need an accurate system to do this. So we decided to incorporate edge detection um, that we found in our research to be a very good option for us to um, do to process images. Um, in this sense, we 
decided to um, go into background modeling as well and incorporate a Gaussian filter and through um, canny edge detection, which I'll talk about through the mathematical theory. So within the mathematical theory, um, most of us know what a low pass filter is. We've learned about it in a lot of our um, theory classes. So essentially it takes out the noise in any given um, photo by ultimately blurring it, but it in, in turn increases aperture with the right layering. Um, so then via the Gaussian filter equation, um, this produces a mask and this mask we take from the X and Y components and this will allow us to get a clearer image um, as we find the size and the direction of the gradient um, via the matrix. And then this will allow us to produce an actual usable feedback. Um, even though it sounds a little bit complicated, th this size and direction will allow us to in turn actually give direction and tell them, okay, this far away, that far away, or find the edges of the given um, image. So this is just in essence what we're um, planning to do. So to the left is just the basic um, edge detection algorithm, candy edge detection. And then to the right is our implementation where we're going to take the image, um, you know, filter it, do the convolution and use the masks to find the magnitude and direction and the gradient. Um, and then we will generate the bit file, which will go into our, um, our device and server, which we will process into um, our vibrations and our audio feedback as needed. So our proposed approach is to have that one closed system with one user uh, facing application um, to have those sounds and haptics feedback and the object detection, audio detection in the home. Really the idea is to create a safer and a better quality of life for the user. All right, here's the uh, functional decomposition of the uh, project. This is the biggest picture. Um, look at it, we have the, uh, the DC power, the sound and the image uh, as inputs and as the outputs, we have haptic and audio alerts. Um, in this next picture, we get a little uh, deeper into it where we see the image goes into the object detection system while the uh, sound will go into the audio detection uh, while DC power goes into all the components and uh, the ob object detection, audio detection go to the Raspberry Pi, which will send the information to the iOS device as well as the haptic and sound feedback devices. And here's just a look at the um, uh, functional decompositions as lists. Um, these can just be uh, breezed over. So here we have a, uh, a diagram that shows the step-by-step uh, -step path taken of the communication between all the different devices. We have the user, the iOS device, the server, and then all the other devices. You can see the path is pretty similar for each device. Uh, we wanted to do this to uh, make it so it's easy to implement other further devices down the line. Um, you know, one of the advantages of a smart home is being able to add it and change it as it's an evolving system. So on the software side of things, uh, we have the uh, Raspbian, which is an operating system that's running on the Raspberry Pi. And on the Raspberry Pi, we have the program Mosquito, which is an MQTT uh, broker. Um, that is what handles the communication between all the different devices. Um, the iOS application is coded in Swift language through Xcode using Xcode simulation um, development profiles, which allows us to write, run it on our iOS devices. Um, in Xcode, we're using MQTT uh, Cocoa framework. This will um, give us the uh, the framework to work with MQTT in Xcode and Swift language. Um, and then with the ESP chips, we're going to be using RDOE now, IDA, and coding in C++. On the left here, we can see two, um, di two pictures of what it looks like on the application currently. Um, this will be changing as time goes on. This is the beginning development of the application. On the right here, we can see uh, what happens when a message is received. This is the code behind um, the message being received on the iOS device. You can see the important line is in the middle where it says uh, the topic, and then it says from door stat uh, from server forward slash door status. That would take um, the message sent to door status, put it in the text box on the uh, iOS application, and then you can do this for different things. You can see similarly it happens for pet location and other uh, topics down the line. Will to add as well. Here we can see also part of the code um, where the iOS application connects to the server. The IP, local IP of the server is listed there with the port. Um, as well as the username and password that keeps the communication between all the devices secure. Um, so nobody else will be eavesdropping on the conversation. You don't have to worry about things like that. And at the bottom here, you can see how it's, it runs the um, connect function, which will connect everything together. Um, so we can start listening for those, uh, those messages. All right, here's a, a visual of the uh, hardware that we have implemented so far. Uh, as you can see, we have a, a nine volt battery powering the system. 
the two white rectangles are the uh, contact sensor, which what happens with that is when those two um, components are close to each other, a uh, blue LED will uh, light up on the board. And uh, they, that uh, contact sensor has one pin connected to ground and the other cable connected to the um, digital four pin. And um, the battery just goes into the uh, uh, V in and the ground. Okay, so now we're going to be demoing the uh, the hardware and software. So I'm going to get that going. And as previously mentioned, we will be demoing our server um, based on the architecture shown before, and then our hardware, as explained by Patrick in the previous slide. Hi, I'm Mark Dagambini, demoing the software side of our home automation um, project. On the TV, I have the server running. Um, right now, I have a terminal window open, which is subscribed to the topic. You can see the T, um, Capstone from iOS. That is the topic that's subscribed to, the username is Capstone, and the password is Capstone. So that's showing that the server and all the communication to it are actually encrypted and sits behind that password and username. I have my computer here, my Mac. This is using MQTT Explorer, which will allow me to um, send commands to the server. Um, so basically, this is emulating a sensor or any other sensors or um, other devices will have on home. That's what this is doing. I have my iOS device here, which is an application that we created here um, that will allow us to monitor the system, see what's going on with it, get updates, get have to feedback for those that need it, other things like that. So let's see. Here we go. Going home. A splash page. We get into the application. Pretty basic right now, it shows the basic implementation. So we changed right on, which shows that it's connected um, pet door and um, pet location, front door status, um, and two buttons here to send hello. Do that. So yes, we'd like to do it. Comes up with hello on the server and also on the welcome message that says we're connected. Um, same thing is going to be here. It says hello, there's all these messages there. Let's update. Sending it. Hit update. I'll be here too. So now what we're going to do is use the Mac as, as emulating the front door. We're going to say that the front door is open. So public perspective. You can see from the server, I have a message. It is that it's open. And automatically, I'll click on the phone. Any I saw Dr. Elman, I raised a hand. Did you want to say something? OK. <laughs> it's All right, so this is. Um, part of the hardware um, implementation we have set up right now. So this right here is a, a context sensor. Um, so this here, uh, what will happen is it will light up. Uh, then LED on the board will light up when these two uh, come in contact with each other. This is uh, a proof of concept so we can uh, see what some of the um, other sensors will uh, be able to do. This is just uh, a test. Uh, so we can implement this into the uh, main system as a, um, a prototype for the um, further sensors that will be in the system. So right now we have a 9-volt um, a battery here, um, and that is a, uh, connected um, to the proto board here. Um, the green wires are ground. So um, this has a, um, the contact sensor itself has a, uh, a wire connected to ground. And then another wire connected to uh, pin number four. And we can see the code here. Pin number four actually um, uh, translates the pin to digital pin number five. Um, and right now it's all unplugged. So uh, we can plug this red pin into the, uh, into the board. And now if we look at that, the owl see if I can get this all in frame. We have the uh, sensor here. And when we put the uh, other magnet, because that's how the sensor works, you see the board lights up. All right, so this is just some of the unit testing that we went through for the um, project. This is the uh, software side that uh, Mark worked on. Here's some of the uh, tests we did with a server communication, iPhone app 
connection and uh, the phone server communication. Uh, here's some of the hardware uh, testing that uh, we went through with um, the board powering on, um, flash, being able to flash the code onto the board and um, voltage regulation is something that we're still working on um, to get a, um, a proper voltage um, that's both power efficient and um, adequate power. Um, because our project has a lot of uh, separate components and uh, we all decided to do them individually and then bring them all together at once. And if someone failed to finish one of these assignments, then we had a backup member to help finish up those tasks. So everyone has to be flexible in terms of hardware and software. And then in terms of cost, this is what we have spent and or planning to spend. So we still haven't bought the RFID transmitters and RFID tags. So hopefully we could find those at a cheaper price to bring us under the $250 budget. Uh, our go no to go milestones on the software side were to construct the server on the Raspberry Pi device uh, with the MQTT client um, and develop uh, and connect the uh, mobile phone application. And on the hardware side was to create the contact sensor using the ESP chip as a proof of concept to implement into further sensors uh, so we have a, a good base point to uh, jump off of for next semester. And this is just a bit of our timeline. Um, as you can see, a lot done in the fall and winter. Um, continuing to the next slide as well. It just shows that we have gone into both hardware and software. We've delved a little bit deeper. We've connected the two, the two via our server. Um, and we're working on iOS application as well as begin RFID testing if, if applicable. And then in the spring, we're going to finish our power consumption management, um, hopefully implement the correct image processing algorithm, and then testing, debugging, device manual, and documentation. So this is just a list of our references that we used. Um, and then if anyone has any questions. Okay. Uh, okay. One question is how how did you power your system? Yeah, I can talk about this. Uh, we yeah. used a uh, a uh, a battery, just a straight battery from the uh, board to the. Um, the pins of the battery you can see it's just a uh wires connecting into the positive and the negative uh initial attempts we were uh i was testing with a um uh, using a voltage divider but uh that wasn't uh giving a a, a good uh a current i believe so it wasn't working well and uh currently i we are working on a uh a, a bjt voltage regulator as well as um doing research on using a, a step-down converter to get a, uh, a safer uh, voltage level because nine volts can be um, a risky business using a, a chip like this. But that, that was to, to get the initial implementation in. Okay, so if you're using a battery, uh, low frequency noise is not a problem, as I can see. Because in this kind of devices, uh, low frequency noise can be a problem, but you're using batteries, so you're fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, did you see any parasitic noise in your system? Did you hook your uh, uh, devices on a scope to, to measure the noise level? Uh, we have not done any testing like that yet, but that is something that we will be planning on doing in the future, especially with the, uh, the uh, more... Um, important uh, components such as the camera and the uh, audio system. And also, you should do uh, an M interference because you're using RFIDs. You should be, you should make an M interference to see how robust is your system. Very this good. is an issue that you, you should do it. Yeah. Electromagnetic interference, how to check the robustness of your system. Very good. That's going to be very important when we get to the audio um, detection and using RFID as well. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Patrick, I would advise you to take notes from what Dr. Advi uh, 